Okay. Let us uh, finish today. But before we do that, now remember that next Thursday uh, I will run through this uh, exercise set one. So it is uh, a good idea that you spend some time from now and until next Thursday having a little look at it. Okay, so here is a uh, exercise one, given a demand curve here and a supply curve, and then uh, a certain I has different values here, producing a, a, a traditional demand curve with only P as a variable, and then we should. Uh, draw a graph here and then there is a market where we have given some numbers and we can find some price elasticities and there are some cigarettes uh, smoked in the US uh, given again uh, price elasticity and we should derive linear demand and supply curves like we did in the example and some other questions here and then there is some utility stuff here with a given utility function perhaps uh, implying that we should do some utility maximization so it's a good idea to to test your uh, knowledge and understanding by trying to work out these exercises, okay? And then I will go through them uh, next Thursday, the coming Thursday. Okay. Where were we? No, I, I actually did a little change here. Let's see, go back here. Let's see if I manage to store these correctly. Because there was the typo in this chapter, which I I suddenly recalled, and I, I came to the conclusion that I should try to fix it before the lecture. Okay, we talked about fixed and variable costs. Then the question is, of course, fixed or variable. How do we know wh what are variable and what are fixed costs? Uh, the answer here, uh, at least given by the textbook, is the so-called uh, time frame we invest investigate. In a very short time horizon, most costs are fixed. Okay, If uh, you look at it in a very tiny time amount, you cannot change any of your costs, basically. As the time horizon increases, more and more costs become variable. If you look at kind of a, a very long time frame, all costs are variable. You can kind of change them. So uh, this is perhaps not uh, always the normal definition. Uh, we had a definition, didn't we? We said that uh, a, cost, a cost that varies as output varies is variable. A cost that does not vary as output varies is fixed, kind of obvious. But uh, according to what we already said in this chapter, this time frame we look at kind of decides on, uh, on uh, w which costs are variable and which costs are fixed. So we kind of need to to look at the time frame here to to decide. Okay, so more on costs uh, here. We discussed the concept of marginal and average costs. Okay, I said that if there is a marginal cost, it's always the derivative. If it's an average cost, it's always the cost divided by something, either L if it's labor or Q if it's up. Typically those two. Okay. So let's look at these numbers here. Um, here again, uh, we don't have L here, now it's the rate of output. So it's the amount of products produced on the left column here. And then, as the cost is fixed, of course it does not vary with Q. So a fixed cost does not vary with Q here, which is the amount of product produced. But uh, the third column here says variable cost, and as you can see at the cost, they change as output changes. So these are obviously variable costs. And then, of course, we can look at something we could call the total cost, which is uh, uh, just adding up fixed costs and variable costs. And you can see straightforwardly that that's what has happened here. 50 plus 0 is 50, 50 plus 50 is 100, 50 plus 78 is 128, and so on. So this column is just summing up these two other columns to produce the total cost here. A marginal cost is the derivative, and of course then you need to know how to compute the derivative if you have numbers. And uh, we have kind of already said that, haven't we? That uh, We will return to formal definitions afterwards. Uh, 
A derivative of uh, say some total cost with respect to Q means that you just calculate the derivative of this total cost function. But then, then of course you have to have a functional description mathematically. In this case we do not have that, okay? In that case you, you kind of replace this little d with a delta. Just like the kind of transformation we did when we discussed elasticities. Okay, so a delta here it means that you take the difference between this total cost number and this total cost number to produce the top of the fraction. And the bottom of the fraction means to take the difference between this number and this number, or this number and this number, and so on. Of course, you always see that this, this, this difference is 1 here, okay? So it means that the marginal cost can simply be computed here by taking differences with two and two consecutive numbers here. So 100 minus 50 is 50, 128 minus 100 is 28, 148 minus 128 is 20, and so on. Okay, so you just calculate the marginal cost straightforwardly here by by subtracting two and two of these numbers. Of course, then you can make a plot of the marginal function, if you like, a plot of the total cost function, and so on. The average fixed cost <coughs> means dividing the total... Uh, no, means dividing the fixed cost numbers by the number of units. That's the average fixed cost. That's straightforward here. 50, uh, 50 divided by 1 is 50. 50 divided by 2 is 25, and so on. Okay, straightforward. Of course, and then you can look at an average variable cost, same structure, but you just divide by the variable cost divided by <coughs> the rate of output. So then it's uh, 50 over 1, which is 50, it's 78 over 2, which should be. 39, yeah, it seems reasonable. 39 times 2 is 78, so it moves along in the same manner. And of course, finally, we can look at an average total cost, meaning combining these two, looking at this column, doing the same divisions to produce these numbers. Oh, you could have, yeah, you see 50. You can never get average numbers on the zero point because you cannot divide by zero. Okay, so it always starts in the second line here for these average and marginal concepts. So this is a numerical example on how to compute these various cost figures that could turn out to be relevant. Here, in a more formal manner, marginal costs are the derivative of total costs. So the marginal cost can, for instance, be written like this. I wrote it like this. Sometimes you can write it like this instead. That is an alternative. This means exactly the same as this. No difference here. Just different ways of writing the same thing. And of course, you can enter the fixed costs and add the variable costs to produce the total costs. And as the fixed costs are constant, obviously the derivative of that one is zero, so the marginal total costs are only computed based on the variable costs. Okay, so the, the marginal cost turns out to be the derivative of the variable cost, which is kind of obvious. And uh, if you need to calculate this without having the actual functional description of the vari variable costs, then you can substitute these small d's with the Greek deltas as I did on the board here previously. So basically there are two ways to calculate these marginal concepts, either through a functional description, in that, take you that case you take the derivative, if you have a total cost function which is something like this, then of course it's straightforward to compute the derivative of this function, of course given that you know know how to take the derivative of this expression. The derivative of 2 is 0. The derivative of 3q is 3. And the derivative of 5q squared is 2 times 5 times q, isn't it? So we end up with 3 plus 10q as the marginal cost of q in this case. Of course, formally, you can 
mathematically define these average cost concepts just by taking either TC or AC or VC and divide by Q. Which is of course is kind of mathematically reflecting what we physically did here. Okay. Anything? Oh. If there is anything, please interrupt me, okay? I'm that's not problems. So now we have talked about a lot of cost types, haven't we? We talked about sunk costs, we talked about fixed costs, variable costs, economic costs, accounting costs, average costs. Yeah. What do you say, Norwegian? Lovely child has many names. I don't know if you have that expression in English, but we have it in Norwegian, meaning that something which is important can be named in many ways. Okay. Yeah. Where does 10 come from? Yeah. 2 times 5 is 10. Oh, okay. The derivative, now, out of order. If f of x is c times x to the power of n, then the derivative of this function is c times n times x to the power of n minus 1. In this case, c is 5, n is 2. Then we put into the formula 5 times n, 2 times x, in this case it's called q, 2 yes. minus 1. Okay. Yes, but was 25? So no, 2 times yeah, 5. Yeah. 2 times 5. Mm -hmm. Sorry for my bad writing. Okay. Uh, here's just some uh, shapes of these things we have have uh, discussed so far. You see on the top here you, how you can construct the total cost by of course the fixed costs will be a straight horizontal line here and if this is the variable cost you just lift it up. Okay, so any total cost given a fixed cost structure will be just lifting the variable cost up some some steps. Okay. And here you see all these other costs, the marginal cost is red here, the average total cost, the average variable costs, and the average fixed costs. Of course, an average fixed costs will always have this kind of pattern, wouldn't it? Because the fixed cost is a constant. So the average fixed cost will always be this constant divided by Q. Okay? This is a, a classical hyperbola, so it will always look like this. That should come as no surprise. It turns out that we really don't need all this mess here, okay? This is but it's something it's kind of nice to know about. If talk people talk about average costs, okay, at least you know what it is. Okay, it's just dividing costs by the number of outputs, output units. So it tells you what it costs you to produce per unit, okay? That could be nice to know, couldn't it? If I produce a car, or actually if I produce 100,000 cars, then knowing how many, what the cost of each car is, could be sensible, especially if I am to sell these cars, okay? It would be a bad idea to sell the cars for a price lower than these average cost. In that case, you would lose in the long run, wouldn't you? Yeah. Okay. Now we come to the point here. The cost minimizing input choice. Problem, how to select inputs in order to minimize costs for a given output. Now the idea is the following, okay, we have our production technology, this production function. This kind of tells us how we can produce by changing these inputs K and L. There is obviously some costs involved here. There is costs on labor, which is referred to as W here, you can think about that as wages. But there is also cost of capital. Okay. Whether we use our own capital to finance, there is still a cost, because we could use that own capital to get interest on it, couldn't we? Or f obviously, if we borrow the capital, there is the rent to, to, to pay, so there must be a capital cost as well. So this, we can then construct this, uh, it says ISO cost line here, C equals to W times L plus R times K. So this is cost per unit of labor, wages if you like, this is cost per unit of capital, interest if you like, a kind of financial cost, okay? Of course you can take this 
mathematical structure and write it different, differently as we have done here. Okay, I've solved it with respect to k here. If I take this one and move to that side, I get a minus in head, so I, I know it's on the left hand side c minus wl, and if I divide by r, I get c divided by r minus wl divided by r, and then k is left alone. So moving from there to there is just algebraic manipulation to solve it with respect to k in order to be able to draw this. This is a straight line in the KL plane given that R, W and C are given numbers. Just like the budget constraint we had in, in the consumer theory. It kind of works the same way. Okay. So this kind of tells us for various values of C it tells us various values of our cost. No, it doesn't. Sorry. For a given value of C, this tells us how we can kind of combine L and K to produce these costs. Okay. Now we can kind of do a similar type of argument as we did in consumer theory. Remember, we discussed this isoquant con concept previously. Let's move back. Ah, that was in chapter 6, perhaps. Uh, let me do it. Okay. I believe it was in chapter 6. Let's just. Uh, b -b 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 -b. Mm -mm 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 -mm. There you have it, okay? We can construct these isoquants, and they are kind of based on this produc production function. They tell us this, they kind of represent the production function, okay? So we can produce these kind of lines, and um, we did produce another kind of lines here, didn't we? These straight lines, these straight lines, and combining those isoquants and isocosts, we can get them into the same, uh, the same uh, diagram. And of course, given some cost structure here, we can kind of fit this isoquant with the tangent structure in the same argumentative way as we did in uh, consumer theory. But in my opinion, it's perhaps not as easy to understand it here as it was in that case. So I suggest we do it slightly different. Okay? It's I say it's easier to understand this through a mathematical version. So let me try to rephrase what we are aiming for here. We want to minimize total costs given a certain production level. Okay? Let's assume we decide to produce 100 units. Then given that we are greedy, it seems sensible doesn't it, to try to produce those 100 units as efficient as possible, meaning at the lowest possible cost. Okay, so instead of maximizing utility, here we are interested in minimizing costs. Let's look at the following example. We assume a certain production function is given. Now we can take a, a simple one and assume that Q equals K times L. That is one example of a production function. We then want to find the optimal amounts of capital K and L, which minimizes the cost for a certain given production amount, say Q bar. This is a, a certain amount which we decide to produce. Okay. Let me transpose this description into an optimization problem. So what we really ha have here is that we have a cost function, which we might, might call a total cost function, and that function depends on the amount of labor we use and the amount of capital will use, don't we? And we know the f shape of this function. It is W times L plus R times K. Do you agree? In this case, it must be subject to not the budget constraint, but to the fact that in order to produce this, we need that this constraint must be satisfied. This is our production function. This is our chosen amount of production. Do 
you can see on the top here this is exactly what I wrote on the board then we can use a similar progression as we did in consum consumer theory exactly the same way of thinking okay let us solve this one for one of the variables put it back into our objective to transform it from a two variable objective into a single variable objective and then we can take derivatives and find this minimal cost amount or actually how we should produce more most efficiently to reach this production level okay in uh, here we solve with respect to L of course then we have to divide by K here so we get Q bar over K we take this expression and input for L here don't we then we are able to tra transform our two variable objective function as we tend to call it into a single variable one where K is the only variable so this one then becomes W not L Q bar over K plus R times K okay this is now a total cost function in a single variable K and in order to minimize it as well as maximize as you remember we find both local maxima and local minima when we take derivatives you can just now take the derivative of this function TC differentiated with respect to K is then and then we need to find the derivative of this function w times q bar over k can be written as w times <coughs> q bar times k to the power of minus one can't it okay and then we can use the function i wrote previously or the rule can use this one now on this structure <coughs> w and q bar are constants here so this is the variable it has minus one so it's w times q bar times the exponent which is minus one times k to the power it has minus one more using this formula directly so this ends up with being minus w q bar times k to the power of minus 2 or if we like as it's written there minus w times q bar over k square this means the same that is how we achieve this expression okay then we have to take the derivative of this one with respect to k r is a constant so it's the, the answer is r then we get this equation here okay yeah we end up with w q bar over k square should equal r don't we if we combine this plus r and equate it to zero as it's shown here we end up with this one equal to this one and then we have to just multiply a little bit over and under here so if you multiply by k square over r on each side we get w q bar over k square and then we multiply by k square and r here times k square over r get rid of that one get rid of that one and you see we end up by k square equal to w times q bar over r and we need to take the square root here to get the answer okay so k is the square root of this expression then q over r so it should be a bar there okay so then I explained how we reached this one okay now I can choose another Q bar I can choose the first Q bar I can choose another Q bar and I can keep keep on choosing any Q bar I like and each time I can solve this problem I produce 
an optimal k and given this optimal k I can also enter it into this equation to find the optimal L and then I can enter both optimal L and optimal K into this one to find total cost as a function of each of these cases. So repeating this procedure would in fact produce CCOQ. We get this total cost function which varies on Q based on this argument. So, we started out here saying that the aim of this chapter is to find or argue for the existence of a total cost function. We base that argument on the existence of a production function and costs of each of the two input factors we look at. In this case, capital and labor. Labor had a cost of W, capital had a cost of R, and then by minimizing this cost for each production level, we can argue that we can find this total cost function. Alternatively, we could have done a similar type of argument graphically here, okay? Changing this, changing that, and you kind of end up. But I, I kind of find this direct mathematical approach more structured here. Because it's kind of easy to get the point here, okay? The point is very simple. We are greedy, we have this production technology described by our production function. Given a certain production amount, of course, then we would like to do that as cheap as possible. So we need to minimize this total cost function. But the fact that it's kind of linked into this K and L means that we cannot, can, cannot do that freely. We need to do this substitution back to get it to work, so to speak. So the conclusion is simple. There should exist a total cost function which varies depending on output. What you basically can say we have done now is that we have transformed our input cost structure into the output cost structure. Do you see that? We have a cost structure related to input L and K and we have shown that it's possible to transform that cost structure into a cost structure related to the output of the production. So you can think of it like this, okay? We enter K and L into our production function, don't we? And out comes production. We have costs here. We have cost R and W. So that cost structure is okay. But what we have done now is kind of mathematically and perhaps maybe also graphically shown you that we are able to find a total cost function on the output as well mathematically. Of course this is theory, isn't it? We can start by saying there must be some relation involving how much we produce and how much it costs. But actually now we have shown you how we can calculate it, how we can find it given that we have costs of on our inputs. And of course if there is more than two inputs the same kind of logic can apply the mathematics becomes more tricky, more complex, but the principle still works. But still, we haven't solved the produ producer's problem, have we? We are kind of only solved, actually we haven't solved nothing, because the interesting decision for the producer is how much to produce, isn't it? And we haven't said anything about that. We have only established that there is a total cost function which varies in related to how much is produced. To be able to decide on how much the producer should produce, we need to move a step ahead. Because then we need to start talking about what kind of objective has a producer. And the, the classical objective in economic theory is of course profits. We would like to assume that most producers would like to maximize profits. And this total cost function then is a handy tool because in order to formulate a producer's profits, we need this one. So that is the next step in the next chapter, unless I am completely wrong. Yeah. Again, here is the graphical rethinking argument. Uh, uh, yeah, it's.
there is something in the end here about economic source scope and scale. Economic source scope. Present when the joint output of two products from a single firm is larger than achievable output from two firms producing one of the products each. Do you understand what this means? If you cannot join two units together to one, you are able to produce more than two of the these two units alone. So it's kind of a, a scope, meaning that can you kind of what do you say? You, you join things together. And there's also something called economics of scale. Isn't you know what that is? That means that if you produce more, you're able to kind of take the cost down per unit. So economics of scope is related to joining units together, and then you're able to produce more than each of these two units together. So you are able to make some organizational changes, so no man, no man, who knows what, okay? While economics of scale is perhaps more typical, meaning that if you pr produce a high amount of products, then you're able to do it more efficiently than a low amount of units. That's economics of scale. But th this is not the main point here. The main point is this one. Okay. And now, in this thing, I haven't done everything. Okay. The idea is, of course, that I need to take this one, put it in here to produce L star, and then take both K star <coughs> and L star to put it back here to get the, the co cost point for this given choice chosen Q bar. Then I need to choose another Q bar, repeat this process, put back, and so on. Okay. Of course, you can do this directly mathematically if you like, but uh, I decided not to do that for you. It becomes slightly more complex. But as I said, we have still not solved the producer's problem. We need to <coughs> let him or her maximize profits and that is the topic for next lecture that probably will be on Friday next week then we are around half in this course and it seems you have a nice time that's because you don't ask too much questions perhaps or because I speak too fast or I don't know maybe you're especially good students that's very nice <laughs> you already know this stuff but uh, when we delve into the exercises, I, I can assure you that you will run into problems. So uh, I think we should spend some time there. Okay? Questions? Comments? Discussion? Yes. According to my plan, we have. Maybe it's wrong. Uh, I'm never sure on this because it's varying all the time, isn't it? Let's have a look at that to be to be on the safe side. No. So we this week is week 37, next week is week 38, Thursday, 12.15, and then uh, remember now it's B136, which is in the other building, this red one, this ugly one, <coughs> close to this one, okay, very ugly one, by the way. Yeah, I'll Very just busy. I'll just uh, turn off this, okay? So we you don't come on the tape unless you want. Yeah. No, I don't. You don't want. <laughs>